Thank you. Uh, to those of you who don't know me, my name is Bobby Miller, and I moved here uh, two years ago. I live in Agramont, and um, I come from New York and Provincetown, and now I've come here to retire and can't seem to stop working. Um, anyway, I wanted to, first of all, I wanted to tell you that we're being recorded by the local TV show. If you don't want to be recorded uh, before you come up, just make go tell this gentleman at the, at the camera, and he will not film you. Um, something I've had to say more recently uh, than any other time before, and I've been uh, doing poetry for 40 years, um, words have become uh, dangerous. So I don't know what to tell you. If you're easily triggered, um, a poetry reading might not be the place to go to, or especially a slam, because uh, it's a different energy at a slam than it is at an open mic or per se, a classic poetry reading, though, of course, we're doing poetry, and it's really all about poetry. So um, I would say that uh, I don't know what other people's material is tonight. We normally have a feature person that's in between the first and second portions of the poetry slam. Uh, by show of hands, has anyone here been to or participated in a poetry slam? Great. Um, for those of you who haven't, uh, a slam consists of a poet being given four minutes uh, for a poem, which has to be an original poem. Uh, it can't be somebody else's material. The other rules are there's no props, no costumes, no soundtracks, no instruments, no music. It's simply about the words. Um, what else? Let's see. Uh, no longer than four minutes. If you go over four minutes, uh, you will be penalized one point per minute, which means that your end score will be subtracted because of the time that you went over. Um, this is the first time we're doing a slam here, and uh, we're hoping to do them monthly. So once you get into the swing of things, it's really a lot of fun. It is a competition, but it's a ridiculous concept to compete against poet against poet or artists against artists. So the real key phrase you have to keep in mind, which is most important about a poetry slam, is the best poet always loses. <laughs> so um, there's that. So work out. Yeah. <laughs> um, and there's no limits on, you know, people say, well, a slam poet is usually high energy and lots of, you know, uh, cursing and bad words and vulgarity, well, that's just only going to be my work when I perform. So, um, but th there's no real limit on topic. It's any subject, any topic, as long as it's under four minutes or under. We're going to kill you if you go to five minutes, but if you go to six or seven minutes, I will interrupt you and take you off the stage myself. And um, we don't, no, nobody wants that. Um, let's see. There are five judges, none of whom are performing tonight, so they have no they have no skin in the game. They're just listening to your poems, and you scored from zero for a poem which never should have been written in the first place, and should be burnt and forgotten, uh, to a ten, which is a poem that you want to hear instantly a second time because it's that good. Um, we have a scorekeeper, John McClare, my husband. Give him a round of applause, thank you. Um, and the way we score is the judges have ten cards with a number on them, and I'll say to them after the reading, after each reading, please hold, judges hold up your cards. We write those down. The way we judge is we throw out the lowest score and the highest score, and then we keep the numbers in the middle and add those up. Um, let's see. That's uh, I think that's about it. Unless, and I usually have a sacrificial lamb uh, to open, who because no one ever wants to read first. Um, but so if there's anybody here who would, who's not competing, who would like to come up and do a poem, raise your hand. Okay, fine. That leaves it up to me. So, and I, and normally there's always a feature perform, a feature poet in between. The, the, the two uh, sections of the slam. Uh, the the, uh, the uh, feature tonight was supposed to be a brilliant woman named Emily XYZ who lives in 
in Syracuse and her car broke down and she's not here, so I'm the feature poet, uh, which who, I'm not going to complain. Thank you. So uh, I'll do one of those poems that I was going to say for the feature and then we'll get started. OK, so um, and since I did this poem here once the first time I came here and I haven't done it since and it wasn't on my my um, my list of what I was going to do this evening, I'll just do it first because it's a it creates a nice energy. So uh, this is called My Life as I Remember It. At two years old, I whistled at the mailman and set a pattern for years to come. At four, I danced in the sunshine of our front yard, an interpretive dance to the gods. The neighbors swore I was retarded. At six, I told my classmates I was from another galaxy light years away. Mrs. Jackson, our first grade teacher, thought it necessary to alert my parents. By 10, Mr. Grady, the art teacher, was alarmed by the colors I chose to paint with, red, black, and purple. In junior high, I was considered weird and neat at the same time because I dressed funny and my parents had tattoos and Harleys. All written reports from the faculty stated, talks too much in daydreams. Some things never change. I watched the Beatles arrive in America and decided I wanted to go to England. I saw hair grow over ears and down over collars and onto shoulders and backs all over the country. I walked with the first protest march in Washington and every other for 10 years, and we still have crooks running the country. I've sat in streets, cafes, corner bars, and coffee houses and listened to the beat of a new generation being born. I went through puberty with Janice and Jimmy and took LSD when it wasn't cut with speed or poison. I smoked pot in fifth grade and laughed all day at a fat substitute teacher named Mrs. Potty. <laughs> I dated black boys at 15 in an all-white clan neighborhood. I hitchhiked to New York from Baltimore with three queens in hot pants, clogs with long bleed shags at 16 and blue truckers all up and down the turnpike. I've been addicted to MDA, tequila, LSD, PCP, speed coke, pot, quaaludes, nicotine, sex, and the mysteries of the night all my life until I hit 28. Since then, it's only nightlife and sex. I've walked barefoot on 2,400 degree hot coals and not been burnt. Greta Garbo grabbed me from behind in traffic and saved my life. I've had green hair, blue hair, black hair, red hair, no hair, long hair, and all before 1973. I'm happy to still have hair. I've walked Sunset Boulevard, Polk Street, 42nd, Hollywood and Vine, Christopher Farland Boulevard, Provincetown, Key West, Bombay, Miami Beach, London, Paris, Rome, Milan, Montreal, and every gay ghetto street listed in the book, and I'm still lo looking for the perfect lover. I lived as a woman for a solid year and had tits. Thank you. I've dated black men, white men, brown men, red men, yellow men, and several delicious women. I've been engaged, married, and loved, divorced, separated, and brokenhearted. I've had syphilis, gonorrhea, crabs, hemorrhoids, appendicitis, dermatitis, and the flu at least 50 times, and I feel better now at 70 than I did at 25. I spent the last 11 years meditating, concentrating, contemplating, applicating, educating, and investigating a higher ideal. I've been a born-again Christian, a crystal-holding New Age visualizationist, a Buddhist, a Hindu, a Christian scientist, a universalist, a bullshit artist, a seeker of truth, a charlatan, a holy roller, a shamanistic dancer, a guru, a disciple, and an enigma to my friends. I'm a triple Gemini natural blonde who loves God and takes time out to smell the roses. I've been around the block at least 10 times, and, 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 I, and I'm ready to go again until these feet won't carry me anymore. I have always believed in the power of love and that the groove lies somewhere between the heart and the genitals. I've never been deliberately cruel, and I've never hit anyone with my fist. I hope I never have to. I've been a whore, a saint, a sinner, a healer, a heathen, an actor, a poet, a drag queen, a straight man, a teenage zombie, a punk rocker, a greaser, a clone, a faggot, a streetwalker, a skywriter, a vegetarian, a teacher, a student, a wanderer, a caretaker, a wild thing, a father, a son, a yogi, and a fierce hairdresser. I've been lost, found, confused, absolved, punished, and rewarded. I've stared death in the face and wondered why not me yet. I've talked and listened and heard and seen and been shown the way. I've played follow the leader, pin the tail on the donkey, five card stud, and Russian roulette with a silver handled 38. I lost 8,000 in cash gambling and won 500 on a bet in less than a minute. I've seen the eye of God and been touched by her hand. I've seen miracles happen and been disappointed dozens of times. I've been almost everywhere, met almost everyone, seen almost everything, done almost all of it, and I'm still waiting to be discovered. The night has a thousand eyes, and I'm a gypsy dancer who's still hungry for more. Wow.
Thank you. Thank you. And our first slammer this evening is Ted Phelps. Let's hear it for Ted Phelps. Do uh, slammers ever talk first? Or they just do the thing. What? Do they talk first, or do they no. just? No. Yeah. <laughs> don't use up, don't use up your very valuable time telling us about the great Is that right? Where's that? Where's I'd rather you use it on your work. Where's the timer so they know? Oh, the timer's here because the timer, the timekeeper's not here, so I'm timing. That way, I know for sure. <laughs> uh, so, in, whenever you're ready, Ted. <laughs> Snow day. Our sledder colors strike against the light. Our sledder shoutings muffle in the quiet. Through the powder barrier we see no school, no job, no club. Only snow can pull this off, can pull us off our separate tracks, can goggle and earmuff us from our race, and blanket us together for a day. We play. Yeah. Okay, judges, are you prepared? to go be abused by the poets that you do bad scores to. Raise them high. Nobody can see them but me. None of you are out to look backwards. Okay, John, you ready? I've got an eight, a seven, a six, a five, and a four. <laughs> so, and we'll, we'll, uh, we will uh, talk about those scores later as we move through this. So the next reader is... Jedediah. Yay. One of my favorites. Let's hear it for Jedediah. Okay. Hi, everybody. Can I speak closely to this thing? So, uh, I am going to um, thank you for coming to my great embarrassment. I'm going to do something uh, in style that I don't typically do. This is a little strange piece that I uh, uh, wrote about a woman um, that I met during the pandemic, and then I, I fell in love with her. We hear you, we hear you, we hear you. Well, I don't know. Well, I don't know where I'm going or really what I'll do. But all I know is that here's our way, that here's our way, that here's our way. A way for you and a way for me. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I stood there, my eyes keenly fixed ahead, as yet unaware of the moment. I heard you call my name, and so I lifted my eyes to you, standing so tall and beautiful, your face of love for the world to see. Well, you, 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 you. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. The has our way. Well, the has our way. Yeah, the has our way. The has our way. And when our lips finally touched, it was like a sensation of home after a night out in the cold. And you've returned to right where you want it to be. Well, take my hand. 
Cause hell we're gone. We'll fly so high that our love will never die. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so from here, it is clear to see at least a slice of our destiny to give and to grow unattached to where we might go. And this is all I know. It's all I know. Cause it has our way. Yeah, that has our way for you and me. That has our way. Josiah, that was great. Um, I always love when people add uh, singing to poetry. It's really good. Judges, are you ready? Hold them up high, please. Oh, wow. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, so I've got uh, two, three. Hold, keep them up. I have three sevens, a three, and a five. And that's Jedediah. Yes. And let's welcome Jonah Bird. Give him a big applause. Can you guys give me the side? Can I fix that way you can get the mics? What? You didn't side. Oh, okay, yeah. So you said to do two or three poems? Just one poem. Just one poem at a time. Four minutes. Gotcha, okay. And I'm actually going to read, because I wasn't sure I was going to get here tonight. I didn't quite memorize it. But, um, this is called Traveling Backwards. Cold contemplation. You've brought me to the brink of myself. Cue the strings and can the laughter. The world up close seems somehow distant and remote. I'm inconvenienced by convenience, moving faster and faster. I'll shove my hand inside my mouth, push button, pull these toxins out, project in high death, streaming past our disasters. There is no why asked, only how. We somehow swallow, forcing down these incongruent shapes, serrated days, when all my insides feel misplaced. I'll diagnose myself. Just let me download this chapter. Which application fills the void where our relationships once resonated deeply? Every empty station greets me with ethereal devotion, presupposing lofty notions. Do we grant them each permission in exchange for shiny fictions? Momentary flash distraction? DNA is chain reaction carved indelibly in you and me. Merely weak muscle memory? I question everything, traveling backwards. Thank you. Uh, that was great. Um, it's great all these short poems on a night when I have less yeah. slammers, but uh, that's okay. We'll work it out. Um, let me stop that. Here we go. Uh, no, I need the score jam. Oh, did you get the score? No, you didn't. Oh, okay. There's, oh, I'm sorry. Scores, yeah. Everybody, judges, judges. Two sevens, two eights, and a six. Pretty good. And of course, one of my favorites, Kitty Kiefer. Let's hear it from Kitty. Only does short poems. <laughs> okay. February 14. A day of hearts and arrows, memories, some hopes, and gratitude, primarily for relationships over and boxed and labeled on a shelf with what's good on top, with obvious disappointments and scars underneath. All remembered. Hearts and arrows. Love is random, unpredictable, never boring, and when new, always welcome. Hearts are soft and warm, and sometimes taste of cinnamon. Arrows are swift and silent. From away or near, front or back, but always swift and silent, and rarely reciprocal. 
I pray the arrow does not hit my heart, never a trophy mounted on the wall, or worse, glued in a book with other trophies. Hearts and arrows, a day so like Memorial Day, but no parade. Remember the fallen, be kind. <laughs> Thank you, Kitty. Uh, judges? I've got two nines, a seven, a six, and a four for Kitty Keeper. Let's hear that, Kitty. And of course, Rosalind May Reese. Thank you, Rosalind. Okay. This is my first time doing a slam. And um, when Bobby, when I heard that Bobby was doing, was hosting this, uh, I went into my archives and I pulled out this poem. A meditation on orange. There is a tree erupting Vesuvius flavor. A tree from whose branches neither hangs pine cone brown nor maple leaf red. Rather, this tree hangs orbs of orange. Who would have devised such trickery, you might ask? And I would reply, whose imagination has played with such childlike abandon to create a tree with orbs of orange? There is a tree whose fruit is encased in a smooth reptilian skin. Touch it. A skin Children cut in wedges and take on with impish smiles in their grinning mouths. Yes, within this spherical wonder is glistening, fully saturated aliveness. Curled up fetuses housed in compartmentalized cells. Oh, to be safely contained, yet to exude one's essence here, a protected permeability. Oh, how does one's joy seep through our boundaries? How can it not? The essence of orange, love that cannot hold itself back. Mid-March, and I am on the back of a Harley, a new acquaintance, my first ride. The orange trees are flowering white. Their intoxicating smells open my senses, and I want to scream in uncontrollable sensory satisfaction. I want to loosen my hold on safety, open my arms, and offer my heart to heaven and scream to be overcome with such sensation. I release an ecstatic response, but nowhere close to the full-blown capacity that I am feeling for the smell of 1,000 white flowers of potential orange. These are the trees that birth orange. These are the trees that birth aliveness, who have summoned a scream that could be heard around the world. Yet here is a woman who muffled her pleasure. And are the neighbors not here to love as we do ourselves? Would the trees have banished me for my ecstatic response to their emitting orange lure to love? God has given us an orange and the juiciness that is housed in the roundness of a snake's orange skin. I wish to allow my cells to erupt with color and screams of pleasure, to feel the potency streaming forth from the navel of my life, bursts of sun shining orange. I wish to know orange, to be orange to exude orange juiciness, 
the unleashed potential, the unbound erupting orangeness of my own life. That was great. Thank you. Um, how long do you think that poem was? Four minutes. Under four minutes. Three minutes and 36 seconds. Uh, pretty good. Helpful, yeah. As opposed to my poem, which seemed really long, right? But it's only four and a half minutes. <laughs> um, okay. So uh, what we're going to do. What? Oh, judges. Sorry. <laughs> judges. Yeah. Oh. Oh, oh, great numbers. I got a nine. I have two eights. I've got two sixes. OK. And while uh, and so instead of doing what I was going to do uh, in terms of um, running through the poet, all of the poets once and then having a fe the feature, which is me because I'm filling in for Emily and then finishing off second, I've decided to take this different route, which is to not do the feature, but instead uh, do at least a poem or two in between. And then we're going to look at the scores and uh, we're going to bring, I've decided also, if you have poems with you, those of you who have already read who are reading, uh, we'll go to the second round where you'll do a second poem and uh, and then we'll, I'll do some more stuff and then we'll go to a third round if you have a third poem. And then we'll tally up all of your scores from all of your, your the whole rounds. Okay, does that suit everybody? Okay, great. Uh, okay. Now you've got no place to hide. Yeah. Okay, so this is a poem uh, that I wrote that's um, on an album with a musician named D uh, DJ Dimitri who had a band called Delight. Remember Groove is in the Heart? Um, and so it has music, but since you can't use music in the slam, I'm not going to do music. I'm just going to read the poem. It's called Word Up. It's about those certain words that come out of nowhere. Words so heavy and hurtful, they fall hard upon the spirit, crashing down on feelings, calling forth tears, knocking years off a man's life, causing strife. Words that lay silent on paper, yet rape the senses with their abuse. So what's the use? Words that never miss their mark, that are aimed at the heart to hurt, to hurt hard. Don't call him nigger. Don't call me fag or cracker or beaner or punk or fag hag. That's not my name. So stop this hate game of separation and fear. No matter the color, no matter the way, no matter the God I have need of today, I celebrate differences. I celebrate differences formed at our birth. I honor and respect all for their worth as humans. So don't call me whitey or freak or au fait. Cut that crap out. I don't play it that way. I ain't no boy. I'm a man who believes it's how you perceive the soul of your brother, who's just like another. So take a step towards real freedom and give it up. Give it up. Give, give, give it up. Come out with your arms open. Stop your moping about what you were born. Because, baby, we're all beautiful. Peace. Okay, so we're going to go into round two now. Yes? Is everyone going to go round two? Yeah, everyone. Yeah. Jedediah, you're up again. And uh, this is a note. Don't be afraid of the microphone. It's not going to hurt you. We want to hear you. And if you're going to move away from the microphone, then uh, uh, project. I felt like I was kind of making out with the microphone. That's fine. Yeah. You like that. Uh, so yeah, I, I was. Uh, I, I have another short one. Maybe if we keep going, I'll do something long later. But I have no idea how long long is. You know what I mean? Anything longer than four is long. Yeah, I got. That's the thing. Like I, I don't. I don't time it. I just write it. Um, 
But anyway, here's a little short one that I'll do that I used to have memorized but don't anymore. Um, <clears throat> sometimes I get lost from words and I can't find them anywhere as if somehow they have left from elsewhere. A place without expression as if that could be. Sometimes I'm at a loss for words. My mind spins, searching the archives, the memory banks of emotion, yet unable to connect thought to letters. Sometimes I'm lost within words, their flow, the nuance of the sounds they make, that magic of the chords and of the tongue. How together they alter history, the moment and the future. How the spoken word led to the written word, which affected the words themselves. From symbols of things, feelings, to the symbols of sounds, sound it out so that it can be written. Written with poise and elegance, written to endure the passage of time, to harness the feeling and to set it to stone, for all to see and know forevermore. Thank you, Kevin Dyer. Judges? Oh, wow, we've got three sevens, a five, and an eight. <laughs> Jonah, you're up again. Jonah Bird. called um, Dancing the Ellipse No Longer. Cut from the same cloth, we are animated after a different fashion. It no longer holds sway, this heart-rending device. Charting the ever-so-limited moments of life, enthralled to the tracing of an elliptical orbit, variations in stagnation, if you will. Know that I can't, won't. Reading the same book forward, backward, and upside down, imposing a thousand quality opinions dressed in the guise of interpretation upon it injecting it with our phobias, vitriol, hateful invective, stirring the masses to absurd levels of dedication and subjugation, gussied up in God's own truth, delivered via one highly suspect receptacle or another after another after another, and which, pray tell, told truth was gospel. Never arriving at anything besides the limit of ourselves, in endless frustrated repetitions, never deciphering the treasures within the text to any real satisfaction. So help me God, I can take no more of the spoiled milk and will search no longer in the nursery of absurdities for meat to sustain form as needs grow. I will not bonsai my soul for the sake of familial acceptance, thoughts of an afterlife intangible even in scripture, or such a dressed up dead thing as tradition. Wow. Mm -hmm. Judges? Okay. Take your time. You have a lot of cards in your hand. Oh, wow. We've got three eights, a nine, and a six. <laughs> Lovely Kitty Kiefer. Let's hear it for Kitty. <laughs> The beginning and the applause. At the beginning is different than in the beginning. In the beginning is Genesis. At the beginning feels less overwhelming and more like Monday morning or opening a cookbook to make a cake. At the beginning of labor, we counted the spaces between contractions. 
at the beginning of our friendship, we went for a walk or a cup of tea. At the beginning of the day, we had sex. At the beginning of any task, there is a moment of plunging in, of taking the first step or the first breath or touching for the first time. The at the beginning is a time of vulnerability, not knowing if it can be done, when the leader says, stand with your eyes closed. There's often a blind spot at the beginning, which sadly is prolonged by last loss of attention to details, or simply wanting something that just isn't so, more than seeing what actually is there or is actually happening. At the beginning was privacy. We hadn't yet fought much less fought in public. At the beginning was some tenderness and looks of longing with kindness and hope, softness at the beginning. Memories of that, the beginning, is why we stay together too long. What I'd like applause for is a graceful ending while thinking about blindness at the beginning, blindness that led to being in a relationship that never should have begun, never left the starting gate, I would like applause for a graceful ending, but because of my misunderstanding, my leaning out, pretending things which were not okay were okay, that set up a false premise or promise for you to lean in on. But then I saw that the beginning never actually began, it was the end, which made no sense to you because you believed what you wanted to be true in the beginning, just like me. But we were both misled by ourselves and by the other. Don't you want applause for a graceful ending? Or is that just me? I'd like applause for the thoughts spoken aloud. They were creative and poetic, but you don't seem to be listening or even paying attention to my facial expressions. I'd like applause for the performance, for the promise of hope and the premise of joy. We said a couple of things the last time we sat together at the dining room table. You knew where I was most nights, and do this for me. And, oh, I got to take this call. There was no promise in any of that. The premise was about you, with not a single promise. I would really like applause for ending gracefully, without violence or insults or door slamming. It is odd to want applause for no drama. I suppose it shows that I have found new ground on which to stand and the warmth of other suns. Thank you, Katie. Judges. change your mind before. <laughs> but only if it's for a higher number. <laughs> Terry, right? Okay. Oh, wow. Okay, we've got an eight, two sixes, a seven, and a nine. Whoa. Great. Let's hear it for Kitty. <laughs> and the vivacious Ted Phelps. You're on. last night. For them, it came as kindly as it could, he had, the last night. A man driving home, a woman close behind, nearing midnight, windows down, music on, each winding of the road as houses flickered by, lamplight fading in the bedrooms, and the vast an ancient universe, black above them. For them, it came as kindly as a silence when each engine died at a turn of the road. Then headlights, radios, powered brakes, they coasted, gripping the double center line lit only by a high half moon until they stopped. The silence simmered. 
the waves of crickets. They called to each other, Are you okay? My car just stopped. Mine too. Stepped out and moved to each other. Held each other's forearms. Then kindly came the rest of it for them as for the others. All the cities, the children, badgers, and sea life, the worms, the corn, the crickets, and the rivers beneath the surface when the sky slit open like a knife on the sleeping island and sun rained down. Yet even in the light or due to it, the woman and the man looked only at the other as if they were each the other's mother at their birth and at their execution in the cornfield where they stood. There, for the first time since their cribs, they held another's eyes without shrinking, and they became the whole of the other. And time blew out around them a great glass bowl, so that they never felt the fair green skin of earth rise and bury all that had been built. Nor would they see the oceans drink the planet fire rock bleeding from the core, making it once more a molten teardrop of the sun. Thank you, Fred. That was beautiful. Uh, judges? Wow. Okay. I've got a five, a six, two sevens, and an eight. Did you get that, John? Yeah, five, six, seven, seven, eight. Great. And that's what I call a perfect length poem. It's filled to capacity. It's juicy. It's a juicy poem. It's filled, but it's not too much. It was just like you weren't even at three minutes to see it. That's good. You know, and most poets don't think about it until they go to a slam. And, um, and now, Rosalind, do you have another poem for us, Rosalind? I could. But you can read from your laptop if you want to. Okay, then come up and read it. <laughs> Let's hear it for Rosalind again. This was written at the same time, so there's a similar theme. It's called is that Move orange? Close to orange. orange? Yeah, no, it's not orange, but sort of. Um, oh, different sound. It's called Resting in Insatiable Hunger. I have a hunger so deep, so deep is my hunger, though I've eaten and my belly is full. I have a hunger where dewdrops from heaven might begin to satiate my thirst were they poured from a pitcher, a pitcher of your lips to mine. I have a hunger for smiles and for laughter, for gazing eyes and, run, and running fingers upon my own flesh. Yet I have a hunger so real that burnt offerings awaken my sense of smell and my vegan imprint might pierce or carve or gnaw at meat I do not know. Still, I have a hunger so deep, a hunger that no outside place nor form can fill. Though trees do offer me solace in the woods and water embraces my hungry heart. Where does the beggar go to be satiated by the gods? And where does the homeless turn? I have a hunger so palpable 
that all I can do is follow the words that are coming off my tongue onto this empty page, this countless moment of momentary hunger, till I rest in the belly of my own yearning heart and satiate my own appetite for home. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that was Rosalind and Judges. Oh, that was seven. Somebody's got sevenitis over there. <laughs> okay, we've got a five, a six, two sixes, a seven, and an eight. Did you get that, John? Yeah. Okay. Um, so now uh, I'm going to do another poem, but um, I also need to know from the poets uh, if you're prepared to do a third poem, that would be great. Then we will tally up the points and there are cash prizes for the person at the top. And then there are prize packages for the second and third runners up. The other two. Uh, just come and hang out with me a little bit. I'll make you happy. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm going to try to do this with, um, with, with not reading it, but I don't think that's going to happen. I found out uh, as you get older, your memory gets hurt. Who knew? Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's a big difference between performance poetry when it's not when it's done right, it's entertaining and fun and exciting. When it's done wrong, it's just you feel like somebody's yelling at you from yeah. the stage. It's never fun. So and anybody who knows me knows that I um, talk a lot. So this poem is called Big Mouth. I can talk a blue streak. I can talk till you're weak in the knees. I can weave tales of wonder so long that children go gray, that straight men go gay, that silent, lonely grandmas seek solitude. I can talk the balls off the proverbial brass monkey till the cows come home and run out of milk, till the silkworm runs out of silk. I can talk the legs off the chair, the fur off the bear, the rug off the floor, the hedge off the door, the lace from a shoe. I can talk the stickiness out of glue. I can talk until you squawk, until you squeal, until you break down and get real. I can talk the spokes out of the wheel. Talk the leaves off the tree, the color out of fall, the painting off the wall, I can talk. Talk the notes from the scale, the sperm from a whale, a model from repose. The window from the house, the cheese from the mouse, the picture from the game, the hour of from the arrow from the bow, the pimp from the hoe. Talk the salt from the sea, the dog from the flea. Talk you from the chair, talk the smoke from the air. Talk the ink from the pen, the thieves from the den, the toys from the child, the beast from the wild, the baby from the cradle. Talk the gravy from the ladle. Talk the balls from the socket, the coins from the pocket, the fuel from the rocket, the food from the table, the name from a navel, the name from a label, the heat from a fire, the lie from the liar, the dark out of night, the fear out of fright, the sheets from the bed, the brains from your head. I can talk that wiggle from that walk. Talk the stalker from his stalk. The potato, the chip, the under the dip, the clam, the shell, the devil is hell, the fireman's coat, the voters vote, the singer is song, the ping out of palm, the ice out of glass. Talk the hipster out of his grass, the knot out of the pine, the cork out of the wine, the honey out of the hive, the jazz out of the jive, the sugar out of the jam, the pork out of the ham, the foot off the shoe, the la-la out of the oo. <laughs> Talk the smile off the clown, the tourists out of town, the bank into a lending, no, but this poem to its ending, I can talk. <laughs> Um, so we're going to go to we're going to go to the last round if everybody's prepared for that. Um, and then while John is tallying up, I'll do my last couple of little poems, and uh, then we'll uh, announce the winners and give out some prizes and have some snacks and wine and say hello and go home to bed. Um, which, as I get older, it seems more and more appealing. I don't know why, but it does. Um, okay, uh, so, uh, oh, where's my, I need the hat. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
You know, I think I love when you do rounds like this where the poets get to read more than one poem. You know, you see the person do a poem, the first poem, and you're like, oh, they're like this. And you get this idea of them. And then they come back the second time and do a completely different poem. You go, oh, they're like this. <laughs> and then it goes on. And so it's, it's great. And I'm very pleased with all of you who are reading tonight. Thank you so much for coming and taking care. <laughs> And we're, and we're back to Jedediah again. Do you have a third poem for us, Jedediah? Well, I have this book. Uh, well, we don't want you to read the whole book, but we want you to. <laughs> okay, let's welcome Jedediah again. The book of Jedediah. <laughs> I, I, I wish I had another book of Jedediah, but um, uh, or maybe this one. All right, we'll try something. I don't. I'm not sure this was ever even finished. It's certainly never been read. Um, an epic battle between angels and demons, the likes of which could fill the storyline of a Hollywood film, or perhaps more likely a low-budget flick stitched together in the 1950s. Its duality flashes before my mind's eye as if it cycles over and over from an old tape reel. Its grainy footage depicts the inner conflicts of my very being, <clears throat> its ever-shifting perspectives, its never-sure footing between thought and action. As I analyze and contemplate in the editing room of my mind, fleeting moments of clarity within the present lead to assurances of the possibility of promise, though soon challenged by the fog of doubt, that haze that leads to the dark road of failure and fright, all the while reflecting the irony of how life of trying so hard, the self-inflicted pressures of fulfillment and success add up to never enough, set up to self-destruct. It is here that I dance the dance of time lost, never gained. How I deconstruct and reconstruct without ever doing a thing. How I bounce back and forth within the confines of my intellect. How my emotions are tossed to and fro in the stormy seas of my heart. And on the outside, life continues forever on the move. The wheels of me somehow always more slow than the wheels of life. And so it is from this place that I always seem to stand just behind the curve. My anxiety risen from the game of catch up, yet never knowing why or how, never quite sure of the next move or where it might go, leaving me filled with the suspense of how it might end and how it actually will. And it is here, of course, that the tape comes to its end, flapping in that haunting rhythm as it spins. And that's it. That, we just had a premiere of a poem that he's never read. And that's most exciting to me when Somebody has written something and nobody will ever see it or ever hear it. And it makes me think of all the poets all everywhere in the middle of America who write for themselves and don't publish their work and don't read their work publicly and will never hear that work. And that makes me sad. So it's really great. Thank you for reading that. Well said. <laughs> oh, judges, sorry. Uh, the seven twins back there. <laughs> Two sevens, a six, a nine, and another six. Did you get all that? Yeah. Great. Okay. Um.
we have the Price Waterhouse over here? Yes, we have Price Waterhouse over here. And Ted, you ready? We have Ted again. Let's hear it for Ted. I'm against this poem because it makes fun of a person's body, and I don't do that. But I did in my freshman year in college when my science lecturer lecturing on taxonomy was the science of what does it look like? That's its category. And my professor looked like a rodent. As I sit, this is called for William Schwenk Gilbert of Gilbert and Sullivan. It's an honorific to him, homage to him. As I sit in science lecture, cleverly my mind conjectures, has a rodent always rats and rabbits habits? Has it fats and furs and funny faces, freakish traces found in places similar to other races? What, you wonder, makes me blunder blatantly to set asunder learned laws of venerated ages sages generated? Bad, you add, my doubting wax and facts and acts in hacks on taxonomic backs and is a black sin. Vex, I venture to prevent your science, selfish, senseless censure, soul, satiric, leering, lyric of my bright and sight empiric. If my teacher's features file him, <laughs> then his class rodentiform must rile him. <laughs> that was great. That was such a great surprise. That's great. That's right up my alley. I got judges. Ooh, ooh. Oh wow, we have four eights and a ten. Our first ten of the evening. Jim the Bird. Now Joan has just literally walked in off the street and it's and it's so great when when poets show up like that. Thank you so much. The side between two poems about my mother in law. She was great news. Not, not for good reasons. Um, huh. I'm going to go with um, scratched. Oh. In my windows of perception, fixed a feral feline form. In its skin's imagination builds an ever-looming storm. Looking past its agitation, one can see the sea and sky. In a seamless, sweet communion, our horizon miles wide. I, azure as I can be, pay no heed and grant no chance to engage her craven nature, lending life to petulance. What awaits but leisure's flower dancing gently on the breeze? Shall we gather waves serenely from the sea all limpid green? Then will laughter be the chatter shrill, cascading wall and floor? Let the god of voice her caterwaul take flight, flip side, back door. With the dawn, her entrance stealthy, bringing friendly mites and fleas, starts to nipping at your boot heels, steady clawing at your knees. Should her squalid heart betray you, as it's doubtless ever done, so entranced by laceration, let the whole world come undone. To amuse exacerbation, letting others pleasure pain, she returns to yonder windowsill to sun her selfish aims. There to wallow discontented, bearing frigid, sour, craves. In my windows of perception lay a ragged, tired cat, half expired in the clutches of a bold, fictitious rat. Should you wish to gain perspective on a creature so askew, solely gaze into her brooding, there to find a stone or two. On occasion they may rattle, finding friction in the dark, there's no kindling and no paper that can ever catch her spark. So my focus is the doorway and the sunlight dancing there. I ignore her desperation, letting laughter clear the air. John the Bird. Judges. You go back there. Stretch, stretch your imagination. 
sevens, two eights, and a six. Let's hear it for Jonah. Hey, John, start scratching out the sevens. <laughs> okay, Kitty, you ready? Okay, let's hear it for Kitty. I don't know how I'm ready, but I'm ready. Um, okay, one night. It's hard to describe that thunder and lightning storm on Saturday night. The air was very humid. Mist and light rain were falling. It was dark. We were sitting on the porch because the umbrella coming up from the center of the glass-topped table was saturated and beginning to leak. Fireflies were starting to emerge from the ferns and the lawn and the grasses on the hillside under the rock maples. <clears throat> Fireflies were rising the way they do when they begin their flights, their evening of lights and show. The rain became more and more, volume of water and of sound. Lightning flashed. We counted until the rumble. <clears throat> the storm was five or eight miles away, depending on how you counted. This was mostly heat lightning, like flash bulbs lighting the whole sky, bolts of lightning, streaks of blaring light, lighting the darkness. The fireflies kept going and going, more and more, lighting the air close to us and around us. Rain sounds, the volume increased as the water became more and more in waves. Water racing off the metal roofs from the porch and the house roof above the porch. Lines of light from the sky, blasts of thunder, fireflies sank back into the ferns and the lawn and the grass, saturated and heavy. The rain flooded the roof and the leaking gutters. Rain splashing on pea stones around the table and in front of the porch. I collapsed the umbrella, <clears throat> cranking it down while getting soaked. Bolts of lightning, booms and cracks immediately. The storm was on us. You told me of how on the farm where you grew up, a strike as we just had killed 21 cows standing together under a maple tree. One strike. 21 dead. We reminisced about how our parents told us to stay out of drafts during these storms. We shut the door to the kitchen so the draft touching us from the outside through the open door to the rest of the house stopped. Then the mosquitoes came. I lit two citronella candles and put them by our feet. Lightning struck the hill above us twice in succession. Thunder cracked immediately twice. Rain jetted out straight from the roof, completely missing the gutters. We backed our chairs to the wall of the porch against the house. The mist of the exploding and shattered raindrops soaked my face and legs. The storm moved on, away, up the hill, quietly. The fireflies began to rise from the ferns and lawn and grasses on the hillside. I made some hot milk. You poured a glass of bourbon. We toasted the beauty of it all, the storm, the sounds, and a friendship, a gift from time. So nice to hear great poetry, isn't it? Yeah. Um, judges? <laughs> Okay, I've got a three eights, a four, and a five. It's really good. Okay, and last but not least, let's welcome Rosalind May Reeves back to the stage. It's so different than I will. Uh, this was written a while back for the Housatonic River. Not sure how long it is. It's called A River Larger Than Its Name. Here is the Housatonic, we say, the river beyond the mountain. This is the Housatonic, we say, as the boy points his finger down toward the water from the Pleasant Street Bridge. Can one point and say, here is this river? It is like taking you in my arms and believing this is all of who you are. No, this river, this river, she flows. 
Where does this body come from? Our water body, our own who satanic? Do tributaries north of us make up the river who empties into the sound? Do we lose our name, our identity, as we are continually arriving into a larger space? She is non-local, rivering, forever becoming who satanic. Yet there is that which is local, where we dip into a moment, the rain, the ice, the sorrow. Still, what of the leaves who fell, the fish that floundered, the birds who dipped into her and are carried on her waves? What of the bugs she is made of? What of the fisherman waiting and his thoughts that spilled over breakfast out from his boots? What of the hand that once held a knife and put it down to now skip rocks from the shore of 183? What of the kayakers, the canoeists whose paddles are placed, were placed with deliberation, echoing eddies of sound? What of the songs, the poems, the paintings that are spun, the daydreams, the fireflies, mating beetles, chorus of peepers and laughter? What of the woman looking for herself? What of the reflecting sunlight, shimmering moonbeams and stars? What of the evaporating waters becoming this air we breathe, who satanic? What of those who lived in and off of the river who are no longer living now? What of the PCBs? What of this river pleading, praying, please bring me back to life? What of the woman, January 1, who dug a hole in the snowbanks by the shore, who made a fire to let go of papers and notes and notices that were raining in her life? Once prayers were said, fire extinguished, she placed the smoldering wood into the currents of a New Year's river, New Year's Eve river, washing away a past. This river, she is resurrecting. She takes everything and now needs our words, our thoughts, our prayers to once again become who satanic, proud river flowing through the rocks, rivering, rivering, rivering river flowing to a place she has always been and is forever becoming, becoming who satanic. <laughs> Thank you, Audrey. You know, when I wanted, when I was buying, looking for a house here to buy, I said nothing next to the Hoosatanic River, because all I could think of was all the rivers are rising. But so far, so good. So <laughs> um, let's hear it for all the readers tonight. <laughs> Oh, yeah, judges, sorry. <laughs> Why well, I forget you guys. Um, okay, judges. One more. Let's see. I got uh, one, two sevens. I got two sevens, a six, an eight, and a five. So, and while John tallies up the final total, um, I will share two more poems with you. I think there's two here. Now, I should tell you, if you haven't figured out already, I'm gay. <laughs> Um, and, uh, <laughs> and living in New York City for 35 years was a great education for me, and I met so many different kinds of people there. I was a hair and makeup artist and a photographer, so I, of course, ended up like knowing all of the drag queens of Manhattan, um, including the Lady Bunny and RuPaul and all of those characters, and they're an endless education. Uh, but I did write this poem about for them, and uh, it's called For Perfidia, and Perfidia is, of course, a drag queen. Miracles can happen, like the time I was a man that became a woman that became the man that I am. Did the heel fit and the illusion of powder and pancake that is the reflection in the mirror that you stand before awaiting her arrival? Not like the sisters who walk by night down by the docks looking for the rent from somebody's lost husband 
afraid to ask for a cup, afraid to look in the mirror of themselves to see what they find, asking that question over and over, who is the she in me? Who is the she in me? The gentle sway of hips that are connected to legs deep in hose and feet swollen in pumps, doing the Connie girl strut and the RuPaul stroll, causing heads to turn all up and down the avenue, lost in that lipstick high with dreams so full to bursting. I'm in a hormone state of mind. Self-induced PMS so bad it bubbles within, ready to burst forth at any easy moment upside your head, motherfucker. The long corridors of suitors, pockets full, ready to worship, and the homage is paid in full. Lost in the ruins of a Disney dream where Peter Pan is a gay man, where Cinderella and Sleeping Beauty rush home before morning like Anne Rice vampires to beat the sunrise of a newly stubbled face. Are you that girl with something extra? Donning lies like garments of illusion, gender bending past confusion, causing heartache contusions while waiting for that magic carpet ride to carry you across the river to a paradise of believers. Excuse me, miss, do you have this pump in an 11 and a half? <laughs> Uh, this is called And the Circle Turns. John, how are you doing on the sports? Another minute. Okay. Uh, and the Circle Turns. These past 20 years spent in New York City in smoke-filled club after endless smoke-filled club, searching in the eyes of strangers for that one moment of orgasmic bliss. He said he'd love me forever that no one kissed as good as me, that he would stay and leave me never, and then suddenly he's gone and free, and I am left standing in the sorrows of my closet, wondering what to wear that will show off my cute butt and big basket, and practicing in my sexy smile in the mirror to set out on the hunt yet once again. I am tired and insane with the burden of the game and want no more to wait at the bar while nameless faces promise to return with drink in hand that pull me into dreams of hollow promises so well meant in the heated moment of a hard-on. Or just a simple illusion like a paper flower crumbled under the footsteps of time. I can't even remember their names, let alone their essence. And I stand drenched in a rain of tears that wash me clean. And I am born anew in the womb of freedom, crying in the arms of my divine mother. Oh, set me free from this fruitless search for perfection. For the time is now, if ever. And in the distance I see, I see a shining light that lo and behold, is it my liberation that has come at last after so long a journey? No, it is not. It's that redhead with the cute butt with a drink in his hand and a smile on his face. And maybe this time, this one, maybe, and the circle turns. <laughs> and uh, this last poem that I'm going to do is kind of a, uh, a gay anthem. And I read it in New York at Gay Pride Parades for the last 20 years or so, and uh, it's called Queer Nation. That's right, I'm just what you expected. I'm the big Mary your mother warned you about. I'm the fag from hell. I'm the all up in your face, fruit of the loom, Mac, magic fairy, jock sniff, and joy boy you ran from in high school. The pansy ass cocksucker with the limp wrist and the lucky lift. The time into a bed and read my asshole, Miss Thing, and pumps to go. That's right, I've got a closet full of flowing frocks and frilly underthings just waiting for an evening out. I'm the gender fuck brain drain, he, she, booty shake, and Nancy boy you read about. The queer faced, fancy pants, pretty, pretty. You're afraid to look in the eye. So gasp and breathe. Gasp and breathe and sigh over the nerve of it all. I'm the one baby, I'm ready to play tag, and guess what, I'm it. I'm the fudge packing mama with a pocket full of condoms, the pussy boy with the wet lips so hot for the hardness of you. 
that out of the closet screamer, louder than lavender and polka dots on a sunny afternoon, the marching down Main Street card carrying homo, ready to fight for my existence. I'm the freaky, deaky, mouth organ girlina you shield your children from. The don't look, don't ask, don't want to know about it. The mincing, prancing, dancing in the street girly man you look the other way from. They get out of our restaurant, out of our store, out of our school, out of our lives. Go away and don't come back another day, guy. I'm here, baby. I've arrived. The closet door is wide open and decorated. And I am freer than a canary out of his cage. I'm your weird Uncle Bob, your crazy kissing cousin with the funny eyebrow. With a wiggle in his walk and a giggle in his talk. So quit your squawking and get over yourself. Because, baby, I'm here. I'm queer. So what? Okay. So now, now comes the fun part. Judging scores and gifts. Okay. So those are the points per round. But these are the... Okay, terrific. Okay, oh, can you hand me that red bag behind that? Uh, it's behind the table yes. there. Um, okay, so these are the scores, and the there were there are there's the winner, the second runner up, and the third runner up, and the other two. Uh, I'll give you your scores if you want them. They're pretty good. So, uh, <laughs> thank you. That's great. Thanks so much. Okay, so. Uh, let's see. The third runner up with 63 points is Rosalind Reese. Let's hear it to Rosalind. And the second runner up is Kitty Kiefer. Come on up here, Kitty. <laughs> Kitty says she has size 11 and a half feet. <laughs> yeah, but you're not that girl with something extra. Uh, though there's plenty extra about you, especially poetry. So. And so for the first place winner with a score of 68 points, completely surprised because they didn't know where they were going tonight and they showed up here. Jonah Bird. You get a bunch of stuff. This is uh, my catalog for my 45th uh, retrospective of my photography. Uh, so I'll sign it for you later if you want. Then this is a book, a, a, a poetry book that I've carried around for decades called Gargoyle, with some of the greatest late 60s poetry in it. You'll enjoy that. As well as this book of poetry of peace, which is all peace poems, which are really, really nice. And also, oh, no, that, did you put this in my bag? <laughs> That's for me, sorry. Um, and a deck of, a deck of, uh, of Star Wars playing cards. <laughs> And twenty-five dollars. Let's hear it to Jonah Bird. So um, I just want to thank you all so much for coming and supporting the first slam here. And uh, yeah. I have, I have an announcement. Okay. After my first reading, I, I saw this glitter, and I picked down, I, I went down to pick it up, so I'm wondering if anyone has lost what looks like an aquamarine, um, <gasps> beautiful, oh God, it's, mine. Be it's yours? Yeah, well, look at that. Thank God. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, that's going right back to the jeweler. Uh, <laughs> That, thank you so much. That's so, I would have been like, oh, my God. Um, so anyway, we're going to be doing these monthly, um, and we're hoping for the 
second Friday of every month. Has that been cleared yet? Yes, it is. Okay. And if you need further information about the upcoming SLAMs, just go to the website here for the Cultural Center for Peace, and that will be listed. If you would like to apply to be a featured reader, which is a paid spot, please see me and prepare some work that you can send to me so that I can look at your work. What else? Thank John LeClaire for being a school speaker. I want to thank all the judges for just good judging, very good judging work. And so, what? We need more SLAMers. We need more SLAMers. So if you know any SLAMers, though I have to say, something happened here tonight to me that never happened to me before, which was I found myself listening to poetry that I wouldn't associate with a SLAM, and yet I think it fit in perfectly, and that people at SLAMs miss out on certain types of classical poetry because SLAMer poets don't read that kind of poetry. They read this, you know, like, so, and, you know, it's all poetry. It's all good. It's all good. But I just want to say that's great, and please come back, and please bring your friends, and write more poetry, and practice in front of the mirror, and spend less time on the written page, and focus on reciting your work. It goes straight to the heart.